just check. Uh, this is all Python code to see if one is in the other. Is point inside rectangle a left a top b all the other directions. If it's true, then it returns it. Otherwise, it doesn't. So basically, it, it now knows if something is intersecting or not. And then it's defining is the point inside the rectangle. So it wants to intersect even when the smallest point is inside. So then you set up pygame, pygame.init. And uh, yeah, that's the way you start pygame in any program, even if it's imported. So my window is 400 megapixels high and 400 megapixels wide. That's basically easy Cartesian coordinates. So I make these direction variables. This is all, this all is Pygame. You have to know this. I'll, I'll just select it to make it look easier. These four. One is the direction that is left and down, which would be, uh, what do you say? Five o'clock, I guess? No, wait, no, seven o'clock. Yeah, so download, don't write is three. You have to make sure these are defined, otherwise you'll have a hard time just memorizing all these stupid numbers which are so useless, whatever. Okay, the speed of moving, I've kept it as four. Not too fast, not too slow. Uh, most, most people will know these color combinations. So in order for me not to type, again, random numbers, I define black as blah, 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 green is this, and white is that. So basically, in the end, you just need to draw the, the bouncer and make it move, and then make the food just randomly pop up, which is easy if you have a good knowledge of Cartesian coordinates. So that's it. That's, that's how simple Pygame can get and how useful it can be, as you can tell from the program. I'm also, a I'm also a beginner, even with Cartesian coordinates. Yeah, so this has been a great opportunity for me to give a little uh, introduction to what I'm doing with Python and how to let you know what I'm doing and how it has been useful for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Shashank. That was wonderful. Uh, now we have Praveen Patil. Uh, he's going to talk about Portable Science Labs, uh, and the project name is XPies. XP's. Yeah.
Hello. Uh, good afternoon. After these wonderful sessions by these wonderful kids, I'm really very tense now. Uh, I'll just try to finish everything in four or five minutes. Uh, this is something about a wonderful kit that with which kids can do wonders, like the one which you have just experienced now. Unfortunately, this is the situation in our science education system. Let me just think of what will happen to a vehicle which has these kind of wheels. One, that big wheel represents theory and the other one represents experiments. It doesn't go anywhere. Most of the times, science is taught from the textbook without giving importance to experiments and real understanding. And as a result, students fail to correlate their classroom experiences to the real life problems that they encounter in daily life. And to correct this, science learning through exploration and experimenting can be a good measure. But if you want to do that, providing affordable, low-cost apparatus, equipment to the students is a difficult thing. Say for example, if you want to do some simple experiments, very simple experiments like uh, generating electrical signal and trying to plot it on a screen. So what are the things we need? We need a CRO, oscilloscope, that is a costly equipment. Students can't afford to have them at home, right? Okay, you need different sensors. Now what I'll try to do is, I'll use this very simple kit and we'll try to fetch data from the hardware using a very simple Python code and, and we'll try to see what kind of signal we are generating. So what I basically have here is a simple DC motor. Maybe in the end I'll show you after disconnecting these things. We have a very simple DC motor, then a small neodymium magnet which we'll get in any toy shop and a screwdriver. So using this, I'll create a simple pendulum-like thing And then, okay, the thing is very simple. Okay, when we power this motor using a DC battery, that wheel starts rotating. And without connecting any power source, if I just rotate the wheel, power should be generated at the back end, right? So I'm doing that. I'm just connecting the magnet to the wheel, and I'll use this as a pendulum. Just a second, please. Okay, there is a small problem there. Okay, maybe I'll try something else first. Oh, this wire is disconnected. Okay, I'll just explain what exactly will happen. Maybe a little later I can show it to you because we do not have that time. So if I just move this, right, it's a pendulum. And the similar waveform, AC waveform will be generated and that hardware can fetch the data and with a simple Python code we can plot it. Okay, a uh, very simple experiment that can be done with uh, different instruments for studying sound waves. A concept called interference of sound is very difficult to demonstrate in a normal laboratory. So what we need is two sources of sound and to have the input for those sources of sound we need frequency generators, function generators and then to plot that we need a CRO. But that can be done very easily with this kit. Okay, what I am doing here is, I have used two simple buzzers. Okay, they will generate the sound. And for activating the buzzers, I am generating square waves here using the same kit. And I am using a simple mic here to connect the signal and the output of the mic is actually connected to a CRO. There is a Python code for this CRO and that will plot as a graph. I'll just try. So I'll just connect one buzzer to one square wave generator and I'll say start. It generates a sound. I hope it is audible, right? And then if I bring it very close to the mic, you can see that wave, right? Okay, you can change the frequency here and you can see what exactly is the difference that is happening. So for kids, it's really wonderful to learn these things by self-exploration. Okay, let us test the other buzzer also, if it works. Yeah, so this is one more buzzer with slight difference in frequency. I'm using 3400 fine red and 3600. Okay, now what I'll do is, 
okay, what you saw here is continuous wave with same almost uh, constant amplitude. If I start both the buzzers together, then you will be able to see something else. Right? This is what happens when two waves are traveling simultaneously in the medium and they superpose. When they go in phase, you get larger amplitude. When they go out of phase, amplitude will be less. So like this, using this very simple instrument, many science, physics, electronics experiments can be done at home. So it's like having your own science lab in your pocket. And the code running behind this is from Python and because of Python, the things have become very easy. For a person like me who has never undergone any training in computer science, never learned any programming, but within two, three days I could learn these simple things. And you people are from computer science background, if you know something about programming, you can do wonders with this. In fact, our dream was to provide a very much low cost affordable science laboratory to every student in the world. And now one student has helped us to develop Android app for this. So with your mobile phone and this, it has really become a science lab in your pocket. Thank you very much. Okay, one second for, for uh, details. You can, you can log into xpies.in, that is our main site. And project is developed by IUAC, Inter-University Accelerator Center, New Delhi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, next, we have Shivanti. She's going to talk about email classification. Hello? It's audible. Okay. Sorry. Uh, my name is Shravanti. Uh, today from morning we were in open space talking about this. So we had a lot of talk about this. I don't have uh, something to demo from a lot of presentation were amazing. <laughs> but uh, this is just a gist of uh, Gmail API and uh, LDA topic model. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, but two months back in Google I.O., Google released uh, Gmail API. So before this, all of us were using IMAPs to access our email server. So Gmail API is uh, very handy, it is faster to access the mailbox. So that is one advantage. And uh, one more is, uh, I'm talking about LDA topic modeling. So we have a lot of machine learning algorithms. So LDA is uh, something which we can use to classify the documents. Uh, so our problem is, uh, basically we are from travel industry. Uh, most of the travel industry, uh, the typical problem is uh, they get a lot of requests through emails. So, and for the operation team it is always difficult to classify the mails. They don't know when is a booking request, which one is, a uh, uh, if somebody is following up or somebody is confirming the voucher or invoice mail. So these are the different categories we wanted to classify from our uh, Gmail. So basically we wanted to group our mails. Uh, so why LDA? Because uh, they are uh, 
quite a number of uh, classification algorithms, uh, KNN, NIBs, support vector machine, many. But uh, for us, we don't have time to label the data and uh, all of the data we had was text. So LDA was fitting well for our case. And coming to Gmail API, uh, I would ask everyone to use this because it, it is really a cool thing they have done uh, from past two months. I don't know how many of you know it. It is very handy to use. Just uh, use your IDs. Usually it will be me when it is when I'm uh, going through my inbox, and uh, you just have to give user ID. And using OAuth, you just uh, authenticate your app, and you can write code using any language, Python, Java, PHP, anything. So for us, uh, we were tracking all the thread IDs, a mail uh, when the when a request came. So when a booking request is coming and when it is turning into a booking and whether it is uh, dropped after giving us, uh, after we give them some codes. So such things we were able to track with this. Uh, these are the key resources you can extract from Gmail API. You can uh, extract the message text, you can take the labels, whether uh, unread messages, read messages and all that. And also you can track the history. So if you want to track only the latest mails from past one month or over two months, something like that. Uh, and uh, for LDA, uh, we have a Python implementation of uh, LDA that is called Gensum. And for uh, processing the text, uh, we are using NLTK. This is my crisp talk. I don't have something to demo. Thank you. Thank you, Shravanti. Next, we have Ramesh. He's going to talk about Ansible. Hello. I don't have slides. <laughs> okay, hi, I am Ramesh. Uh, I will be talking on Ansible. Uh, I don't have any slides, so I will be just going through the Ansible website. Ansible, uh, how many of you know what, uh, how many of you know Puppet? Okay, okay, so Ansible is a simple IT automation tool uh, which is built using Python. Uh, it, it uses, uh, it doesn't need any client-side uh, software to execute, uh, execute it, its, its playbook on the host. It simply uses SSH to connect to the host. Or it uses OpenSSH or you can use Paramico, Python's Paramico library to connect to the remote host. So, so using Ansible uh, you can do configuration management, you can do deployment, you can run uh, add up commands, you can also do testing using, uh, simply you can do any automation using Ansible. So can you, okay, uh, at the core of Ansible, uh, there is something called modules. Uh, Ansible already com comes preloaded with 200 plus modules which are written in Python, core Python. But apart of, apart of Python, you can also use uh, any language like C, Java, Ruby, even Bash. The only condition it should not is it should emit JSON output. Unless, unless and until you are giving JSON output, Ansible can accept any damn language you, whichever you want to use. So apart of module, uh, so modules are the heart of the, at the, at the heart of the Ansible. So you, you write, you, you include the uh, modules in the playbook. Playbook is a playbook is a simple YAML file which which contains task and and this task will in task will uh, execute your modules. So simple task file will look like this. So this is a task file. You are saying what all host you want to execute on. So this is a group name which will will cover later. So these are the simple tasks. You give a human readable name for the task. 
you specify the module in this case it's a m and you are saying it to install HTTP package and its version should be latest that's all just uh, just these two lines of code will actually uh, install your HTTP, HTTP HTTPD on your remote host using SSH okay. so so for for playbooks to execute you need to tell them what all host to execute on so so Ansible relies upon an inventory file where you where you pass all your host uh, you can also pass your host groups for on that so you can directly pass the group name and it will run on all your host it's again a simple ini file windows which windows uses uh, apart of that uh, ansible also provides some cool stuff called plugins plugins uh, uh, it's a callback plugin so whenever you execute a playbook you can, if you want to run a separate piece of code like when a when a playbook executes it finishes its uh, it's, it completes its execution. You want to run some. You want to notify a group of people, so you can write an email, a short script which will email the output of the Ansible Ansible execution, and it will it will send it send a mail to the users you want to notify. Or you can add something like logging and other cool stuff. So it simply goes like you 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 execute a ansible task you you pass your playbook and playbook will uh, in playbook will have your custom modules which will which will run those modules on on the host which you which is specified in your host inventory and it will and it will just and it will give you the output and uh, depending on that you can run your callback callback plugins which will again notify your users or do other cool stuff mm. yeah uh, that's it so, so one 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 good thing about Ansible is it compared to other other configuration management tool like Puppet, Self, and Salt, it's like it doesn't need any agent, right? On the client client side agent, it simply uses your OpenSSH or Paramico, and you can also even have a pull base uh, pull base uh, setup where Ansible will pull all your playbooks from your Git repository directly. So you don't need to SSH it. You can set up a cron job and it will again it will pull your uh, playbooks directly. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, we have one more slot available. Is there anybody else who wants to give a lightning talk right now? Cool. Come. So next we have Shantanu who is going to talk about AWS. How many of you have used Amazon Web Services? <laughs> A lot of people are there. Boto? I am just going to tell you something about Boto. First of all, some of the people who don't know about Amazon Web Services, this is how the screen look like when you log in and this is how your uh, S3 look like. S3 is a, is a service where we store all our, all our files. Redshift is for big data and EC2 for all my servers. This is T1 macro, cheapest one and this is N3 to extra large, which is very costly. If you want to see the bill, you can also see the bill. Boto, now you can use the same interface to um, uh, uh, to manage your web services, all this uh, S3 and Redshift, but Boto is much more important. See, when you say import Boto, that module gets imported and you can start working with your Amazon, Amazon properties. Here what I am doing is that I am just giving access key and secret key so that I can connect to my account. Then I am, I am creating three accounts, Red, Redshift connection, EC2 connection and S3 connection. So I am creating three connections using this Boto module, and these are the uh, these are the methods of Boto. So Boto dot connect Redshift will connect me to the Redshift. Then I will use this connection object later on to create Redshift uh, clusters. 
I will use EC3, EC2 connection module, uh, connection object later on to create my servers and S3 connection object for creating, uploading S3 files and downloading files and deleting the files. Just see how it is done. This is my, I will just uh, first, let me show you the EC2 things. List all reservations, so EC2 con, the EC2 connection that I just created, take that connection object, get all instances, will list all the instances, that is all the servers that I am already having, that is this list, the list of three servers. So what I am saying is that instead of going to my uh, user interface, through programmatically I am managing my Amazon resources, first I import Boto, I give access key and secret key to connect to my account, I create an EC2 connection object and then I say get all instances, to get all the instances, then I will get print reservation instances, so I will just print it. So just three lines and I get all the instances which I have. I can also get uh, get only instances and I can also connect the, I can also create a new instance, create an image, I can create images, start an instance is uh, run instances is the method and use as EC2 connection object and run instances, AMID is this AMID, the image that I want to base my EC2 instance on. So I am creating an instance just using four lines of code, I can, I can create n number of servers, I can have as, and I can configure that server as well. Whether I want it um, uh, 6 GB, uh, 4 GB, 8 GB, 64 GB, Amazon EC2 has n number of options. I can also manage my hard disks, I can manage attached volumes, I can terminate an instance, I can copy a file to S3 and I can delete a file from my S3 bucket. And Redshift, how many of you are using Redshift? Oh, quite a few. But there are, Redshift is really a good option for database. If your MySQL is not scaling and you have a big data, really big data, use Redshift. And here how you can do it programmatically, check the active clusters, start a new cluster. All the, your Redshift can be managed like this. Just four lines of code and you can do anything in uh, Amazon properties using Boto. Boto is extremely powerful. Use it, you will like it. <laughs> Thanks.